Hey guys, uh, welcome to my channel, and uh, I guess I'm hoping to do this recurringly, but I want to, you know, have this as a place to talk about systems design. I'm currently studying it a lot myself, and I feel like I've learned a lot in the process. But uh, yeah, let me give a quick introduction about myself and, and why I'm doing this. So um, I'm an incoming software engineer at Google. Sorry, you got clickbaited. Um, and I literally have nothing that really qualifies me to actually talk about systems design. I'm not a senior engineer or anything, but... Um, yeah, you know, I've been uh, learning it and uh, watching a bunch of these YouTube videos. And, um, you know, there's a few re reasons now that I want to make this channel. Um, one is that I'm a narcissist and I like the sound of my own voice. But two, and probably a lot more importantly, is I find that a lot of the existing resources, especially YouTube videos, are from people who really oversimplify things, right? Like they'll build this huge system. They'll be like, okay, I'm going to build a Facebook Messenger. And then they'll talk about um, all the design choices that you have to make and go into basically zero details on why they choose one technology versus another. And that always really frustrates me because I would like to see a deeper dive because I feel like, you know, you're kind of just a sham if you um, just regurgitate some YouTube video. And, you know, if your interviewer is like, any like any amount of smart or skeptical he'll just ask you why you made the choices you did and you're not going to be able to answer and so you know i think part of that is you know doing more of a fundamental dive onto how some of these technologies actually work before you just go into you know full-scale system design example problems and uh, that's what i'm planning to do so you know without further ado i'm going to talk about database design and uh yeah hopefully it helps you guys out all right so let's talk about database design just to start from the beginning, for those of you who are really new to this stuff, and keep in mind I have timestamps if you want to skip around, what actually is a database? Well, for starters, if you and your friend, or, well, since we're programmers, we don't have friends, but if you and another person want to access the same piece of data from an application, or you just want to access it in the future, such that it's not actually on your local device again, you're going to need a database. Um, generally, clients will interact with a web server, which will then go ahead and store all data that needs to be persisted or kept in the long run on a database. The objectives of the database are pretty simple. Obviously, if you're a big company and you hold a lot of data, all you really want to do is have fast reads, fast writes, and durable data. What that means is if the power goes out on the machine holding the database, that the data doesn't get lost. So how do we do that? Well, we would use a hard drive. Hard drives are basically pieces of hardware that go ahead and hold data for a durable amount of time. Um, as you can see, they basically work by having that little penis arm thingy go and spin around the, met uh, the metal disc, which goes at either 5400 or 7200 rotations per minute, generally speaking. And the big thing to note here is that with hard drives, you always want to aim for sequential operations. What that means is that it speeds things up quite a bit to be accessing data that's much closer on the disk to one another. So having to jump around all over the disk means the penis thingy is going to have to do even more searching, and it's going to take forever to actually find and write the data that you want. Okay, so let's talk about what a naive database implementation might be. Think of it basically as an array of tuples. So every single time you want to read, you have to search through the array, and every single time you want to update, you also have to search through the array for what it is that you want to update. Um, writes are still in constant time, which is good, but for our purposes, this clearly isn't good enough. Um, as you can see, if you want to update something like um, ID3 over here, you literally have to go find it and then change it in place. A slightly better implementation is an append-only log. What that means is that you actually overwrite things by just writing an additional entry in the log. This way, you can actually benefit more from sequential writes. So I'll go ahead and show how that would happen. As you can see, I've literally just added another row to the log, and that way I know that searching from the bottom to the top of the log, I can actually get the correct data. Something even better would be to use a hash map. Uh, if you remember from your algorithms class, you basically use a hashing function to map a given key to a certain place in memory, and the hashing function should distribute those keys out in such a way that you're able to get constant time accesses, and also that just means that you can read and write really easily. However, this doesn't really work well. The second that you can't fit your entire hash map in memory, it's really bad to put a hash map on disk by virtue of what we discussed before, which was that random reads and random writes on disk are really bad because the mechanical arm has to go around and spin all the time, and it means that it's going to actually take longer to edit that data. So as you can see, while hash maps might be really good when there's a small data set, um, the second you're dealing with a ton of data, which is mostly what we're worried about here, they become pretty infeasible. 
So let's talk about how we can make uh, reading faster because we just spoke about writing. Basically writing you can solve by literally just using an append only log. However, reading is kind of the bigger issue because a lot of applications are super read heavy. So how do we actually make reads faster? We use something called indexes, which basically keep extra pieces of metadata on every single write in order to help um, track uh, which values of certain rows are the same, and that way you can um, basically query them really easily. So looking at the table in the bottom right here, if um, I want all the rows with customer ID 2, for example, I could really quickly find them without having to do a linear time scan of the entire data set. So obviously the pro of this is faster reads, but if you put an index on every column such that you can efficiently query the data using every single column, what's going to end up happening is that writes are going to take a really long time. Okay, so let's go over three types of index implementations, and uh, these are basically the fundamental different types that you can use. And um, by going over them, we'll have a good idea of which databases to use for certain applications and why. First of all, hash indexes. Uh, like I mentioned before, this mainly relies on a hash map, which means that all of your keys basically need to be able to fit in memory. The entire point of the hash index is that for the field that you're indexing on, you take the key and then you map the offset on disk as the value in the hash map so that that way I can literally do an O of 1 constant time access in RAM and then I would be able to easily scan to the disk. There are a few problems with this, one of which I already mentioned is that uh, if the keys don't fit in memory you're screwed out of luck because hash maps just work really poorly on disk and additionally and perhaps even more importantly if you want to do a range query which means you want to quickly find all of the keys with a given range of values um, they're going to be scattered all around disk and that's going to be very inefficient because then you have to keep doing more random accesses. Okay, now let's move into another one that is a little bit more feasible for actual databases. These are called SS tables and LSM trees. So the way that this type of thing works is on writes, you would first write to an in-memory buffer. So this in-memory buffer means that on RAM, you would have a self-balancing tree, like a red-black tree or an AVL tree. I don't know who the fuck might remember that, but apparently some people actually know how those work. Um, so anyway, that would be called the mem table. When the tree becomes too large, you take all of the contents of it, which should be automatically sorted by virtue of using a tree traversal, um, and you would write them to something called an SS table file. And that SS table file would be held on disk. Um, in the event that the database crashes, obviously whatever's in memory is going to be lost. So we keep a second log called a write ahead log, uh, expressing all of the changes that we have in the tree. And that way, um, if the machine crashes, you can easily restore that tree. Um, furthermore, I should note that once you write the tree to disk, uh, you reset the tree to nothing again and then you start writing keys in there. So as you can see, writing a key would literally just be adding it to the LSM tree. Okay, continuing. So I've mentioned that you write LSM trees to SS tables on disk. So here's what SS tables might look like. As you can see, the keys are actually sorted, and right next to them are their values. So using NBA players here, I have 0 for Russell Westbrook, 7 for Carmelo Anthony, 9 for Dwayne Wade, and so on. And we might have multiple of these SS table files, like I mentioned, because every single time that that LSM tree gets too big, you're writing it to an SS table. Another thing to note is that you might actually have duplicate keys between the two. Um, since everything is an append-only operation, if you want to overwrite a key, it might just go into a newer SS table file. So by virtue of overwriting the key 33, we can see that the value of it changes from Jabbar to Pippin. Okay, but the issue is, by virtue of having all of these duplicate keys, we're potentially wasting a ton of storage. If you're updating the values in your database a lot, you might be using a ton of space that you could actually just get rid of if you were to somehow compress these SS tables. So that's exactly what we're going to do. As you can see, we're now turning it into a compacted SS table. And what does that mean? It means that all of the duplicate keys are going to have their updated value, and additionally, all of the other keys are also going to be in the compacted SS table. How do we merge these together? Well, it's actually really efficient. If you remember from merge sort, you basically start at the top of each SS table and then start taking the keys in order. So I would start with Westbrook and Iverson and say the zero for Westbrook is smaller than the three for Iverson, so that's gonna be first in the compacted table. Then we would say the three for Iverson is smaller than the seven for Anthony, so that's going to be next. Five is smaller than seven, and so that's a linear time operation between those two tables to easily compress them. And so that's a process that often gets run in the background to optimize in storage space. 
So as we can see, that's merged in linear time. And in the case of the duplicate key, such as uh, 23, 33, and 34, we're always going to take the more recent value because that's the correct one. So we're always going to give file two here precedence over file one. Okay, continuing further, we've discussed how we might write to SS tables in LSM trees, but now let's discuss how to read. So firstly, when you're looking for a key, you would query the mem table. We would literally just do a binary tree traversal and look for the key in there, which is O of log M. Secondly, we would look at each SS table in order from newest to oldest looking for the key. The issue with this is that fundamentally, you might go through SS tables until you have none left. And if there are a lot of them and the key is not in any of them, you've wasted a ton of time. Um, there's an optimization called bloom filters that kind of help this out. So in practice, it's not actually so brutal if the key doesn't exist. But even still, from a theoretical perspective, it's bad on reads. Another optimization to that is the fact that all of these SS tables are sorted. So what we can actually do is keep a sparse in-memory hash table for each SS table so that we can quickly search them. So for example, in the SS table below, you see I have a bunch of names of people and their corresponding ages. So what I'll do is I'll keep a small hash table so that I know it can fit in memory of basically the keys uh, that are sparse but in order and their memory addresses. So say I have Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and I know all of their memory addresses, and I want to be able to find Andy. I know that Andy's key is between Alice and Bob because the SS table is sorted. So I'd actually start at the memory address of Alice and start at the memory address of Bob and run a binary search. What that means is that I would basically be splitting the, the disk chunk between them in parts of two, and that way I could do a log n search on a sorted array. Um, if you don't remember binary search, you can definitely look it up and it's really easy to understand. Okay, so to summarize SS tables and LSM trees, the pro about them is that writes are really fast. Um, there's an in-memory buffer and writes to memory are always significantly faster than disk because memory is just much closer to the CPU. Um, additionally, they're very good for range queries. So if you want a range of, uh, if you want to get all of the values for a range of keys, you could really easily do that because ranges of keys are stored together in the SS table since they're sorted. Um, the bad part is that reads are relatively slow. You might have to go through a ton of SS tables and do a lot of searching, and that could potentially be pretty devastating. Um, additionally, the fact that you're merging resources in the background might actually use some database resources and make things a little bit slower. Okay, moving on from SS tables, which is one implementation of an index, now we have another one called a B tree. The entire point of a B tree, which is decently simple, is to model your data such that it is a tree on disk. So let's say I have a bunch of names and I want to be able to find the corresponding age like I did before. As you can see, I want to be able to keep all of my data in order and then have pointers down the tree to show where the actual data is. So as you can see in the top level here, or the root page, I would have a reference between all keys that go from A to E, out of reference from all keys that go from E to P, and all keys that go from P to Z. So let's say I want to find the name Thomas. I would first take the ref from P to Z, because I know that Thomas is between the letter P and Z. Moving on to the next page, I would now say, OK, I'm going to take the ref between T and Z, because Thomas is between T and Z. Finally, I would ultimately go to the page where values are actually stored, which tends to be about three or four levels down to have many, many um, terabytes of storage, assuming the, the tree pages are large enough. And as you can see, I can easily get my value. All this can be done in logarithmic time. So to actually put this into words, to read, you literally just traverse through the tree and find the value. To update, you traverse through the, tr the tree, find the value, and then update it. And then finally, to write, this gets a little bit more complicated because if there is space in a given block where a key should go, then you can just put it there. And if a given block of the B tree, so like one of those um, layers of it basically, is out of space and there's no room to add the key and its corresponding value, then you actually have to split that page in two and update the parent page to reference both of them. Um, the thing is that process can actually, um, you know, if, it, if um, splitting the pages and updating the parents, if the server crashes, um, you're actually going to have to be able to restore that. So what you can do is use a write-ahead log similar to with LSM trees, where you write all of your changes down tentatively before you make them, so that in the event of a crash, you can go and restore that. Okay, B trees, what are they good for? Well, reads are very fast because you have a logarithmic time complexity and you're only going down around three or four levels. Um, another good thing is that it's really good for range queries, as all the keys that are um, 
you know, next to one another in the actual range are physically next to one another on the drive. The biggest con is that writes are slow. You're writing directly to the disk as opposed to an in-memory buffer, like on an LSM tree. Okay, so let's get to a conclusion. Um, obviously, in a system, it's really important to be able to justify um, the choices that you're making. And in a systems design interview, if you just named a database engine and said, I'm going to use this, um, you'll obviously get a look and they'll say, well, why would you do that? So now you can actually justify this. Um, hash indexes are great, but they're really only useful for small data sets. So maybe something like a Redis database where everything's already in memory could work well. Um, an SS table and an LSM tree is really good for when you have to write a lot and write quickly but it's not great for reading because you risk having to go through a bunch of SS tables. Finally, B trees are really good for reading, but a little bit slower than SS tables and LSM trees for writing because you're not writing to an in-memory buffer. All right, I hope that was um, a deep enough dive without being too overwhelming. Um, if you want more information on this subject, I definitely recommend reading Data Driven Intensive Applications by Martin Kletman. But uh, yeah, hopefully you guys can now make more informed explanations about how databases work and these two types of database designs that are pretty crucial for determining the uh, performance of both read and write throughput.